Thank you so much, uh, Isra, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you uh, for the coalition for inviting me uh, to speak uh, today. I apologize. I had a PowerPoint presentation prepared, but there were some formatting issues. So I'm just going to be reading from the slides. Hopefully you don't get too uh, disinterested and, and turned off. Um, you'll just be hearing my monotone voice the entire time. But I'll talk a little bit about uh, the Red Nation and the work that we do, uh, as well as at Red Media, and why that connects with Palestine. So first of all, you know, the Red Nation was founded in 2014. We in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, in uh, Diné and uh, Pueblo territory. Um, we began by addressing what we saw as uh, border town violence. It's like vigilante or state violence against Native people in places um, that we consider border towns. And we it's a very contentious term to say that, but it's a common uh, term within indigenous communities in these regions. And typically we think of borders uh, or border towns as those on this, you know, the so-called U.S.-Mexico border or perhaps the northern uh, Canadian-U.S. border. Um, but we think of border towns as those, uh, you know, white dominated settlements that typically ring Indian reservations, um, where these sort of confrontations of sovereignty, of political legitimacy and authority kind of come to a head. And it's it comes to a head through the everyday criminalization of Native people and their presence on the land. Uh, and that's an incredibly important you know, a topic uh, to an entry point into discussing uh, the topic today, which is settler colonialism. Um, but of course, as a Red Nation, we weren't just focused uh, specifically on uh, police uh, or state violence against Native people within these uh, these geographies of border town violence. Um, but we looked at the sort of broader sort of imperialist uh, scale of this violence and the project of the United States from the beginning uh, of its foundation in 1776, and perhaps even before that, uh, to the present day, um, and why the United States um, is sort of has aligned itself with, you know, historically with the sort of imperialist European powers, but now has become the global hegemon. Uh, and that actually begins here on this land. It doesn't begin uh, you know, elsewhere in the world, typically we think of uh, imperialism or settler colonialism according to really outmoded theories of, you know, the what they call the blue water thesis or the salt water thesis, meaning that it can only be imperialism if somebody, typically a white European, you know, travels across a body of water and colonizes a place, right? And we know that that uh, just simply isn't the case. Uh, first of all, ge geographically and territorially, that doesn't make sense, you know, because uh, Europe is is a is a complete social construct. It's literally just Western Asia <laughs> when you think about it. So, how did it colonize parts of Asia? Uh, and then it's also, you know, st also still somewhat connected to uh, the continent of Africa. So these things are just arbitrary, and they're social constructs uh, made to sort of. Uh, give us an idea of of what is and what isn't imperialist and what is and what isn't a uh, settler colonial. So oftentimes, if the United States is talked about as as possessing, uh, you know, colonial territories, it's typically we think of Puerto Rico or Hawaii or Guam uh, or something along those lines, typically island nations, right? Or there's a body of water separating them. Um, but we don't think of settler colonialism or we don't think of colonialism or imperialism as something that is continentally connected right um which which i'll, I'll get i'll break it down a little bit later um but i just want to kind of throw that out there right away to to think about why is it how did the united states become you know not only the global hegemon but the main benefactor of the Israeli Zionist settler colonial project in Palestine. How did that happen? There are several sort of explanations for this. You know, one is the sort of ideology, right, um, of manifest destiny, which I can talk about uh, in a bit, uh, and the concept of Zionism, right? It's important to point out that Christian Zionism actually preceded what we now know as the modern sort of Zionist movement. And in fact, there are more Christian Zionists in the United States than there are, you know, uh, Jewish Zionists proper. That's a that's an important facet 
uh, to point out because it's typically non-Jewish people. There are more non-Jewish people in the United States that support the Zionist project than there are Jewish people. And this is this it has to do with ideology. It has to do with geopolitics. Um, and, and in the case of Christian Zionists, it's grounded in a sort of religious uh, kind of a fundamental understanding of what the Holy Land is. But it, as we'll see in a bit, it ties into uh, broader geopolitics. But before I continue, I just want to um, give out some resources because um, you might fall asleep by the end of this this talk. Hopefully you don't. But I just want to give out some resources um, that I recommend everyone uh, 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 read. There's a great uh, website called decolonizedpalestine.com. It's, it's a very uh, useful toolbox. It's a 101 explanation of all the myths that Israel uh, and its backers put out there in terms of, you know, it's a anti-colonial movement. It's a you know, uh, uh, Zionists are actually indigenous. Oh, I got some confetti. I don't know how that happened through scare quotes. Um, uh, or that it's a conflict or it's a conflict between nationalisms, like an Arab nationalism and a sort of Jewish nationalism. Uh, and they do, they go through great pains at deconstructing, uh, and debunking these notions. The other, um, the other, uh, uh, resource that I would recommend is it's called indigenous for palestine.org. This was a uh, formed in collaboration with the red nation, as well as other indigenous organizations, um, initially started as a letter writing campaign, um, to get tribal leaders, uh, and, uh, our, our leadership to, to acknowledge and to condemn, uh, Zionist aggression against Palestinians, uh, in sort of understanding our, Sort of our situations uh, under settler colonialism as connected, um, but we we over the time we've developed some blog posts, uh, sort of connecting the current moment to a broader history of indigenous resistance, as well as some resources that are specifically about indigenous and Palestinian history. Um, so I recommend uh, checking those out. We have some wonderful. Um, YouTube uh, interviews um, that you can access. We have the Red Nation podcast too. If you're not already a subscriber, um, those are just some you know sh shameless uh, self promotion. So just let's get into some definitional um, uh, definitional sort of terms, right? So I, I said I said several things like imperialism, settler colonialism. Um, those are some you know ten dollar words, as my dad likes to say. Um, but they're very important to understand. First of all, we didn't invent them. There's this kind of notion out there that like native people or, you know, left or woke, the woke mob uh, or the the uh, the people that Zionists like to label as anti-Semitic, which are just people who are critical of the Zionist project. They like to say that we invented settler colonialism, which isn't true. It's actually uh, settler colonialists invented that term, <laughs> settler colonialism, and they called themselves settlers and colonialists and colonizers. It's just when it became out of vogue that they began to change the name and the nature or tried to redefine the nature of their project. We can see that in, in the concept in the in the context of uh, of of Israel, for example, the original founders. Uh, such as like Theodore Herschel or like uh, Zionist thinkers such as Jabotinsky um, actually called this a, a, a colonial project and referred to themselves as the future settlers of of this of Palestine. And even they, you know, people are like, oh, Palestine is an invented term, but they even use the term, you know, Palestine. And I just want to read uh, one uh, quote um, to kind of give you an idea of how uh, these, uh, you know, these these early Zionist thinkers were thinking about um, Palestinians, indigeneity, and settler colonialism. And this is a quote from uh, a 19, 1923 uh, article called The Iron Wall by um, Zayev, uh, uh, Jabotinsky, who was uh, a Russian uh, uh, Zionist. Um, but he he writes, you know, every native population civilized or not, notice the language, regards its lands as its national home, of which it is the sole master, and it wants to retain that mastery always. It will refuse to admit not only new masters, i.e. Zionists, even new partners or collaborators. This is equally true of the Arabs, i.e. the Palestinians. Our 
peacemongers are trying to persuade us that the Arabs are either fools whom can be who can deceive by masking our real aims, or that they, they are corrupt and can be bribed to abandon us uh, their claim to priority in Palestine. Notice the word Palestine in return for cultural and economic advantages. I repudiate this conception of the Palestinian Arabs. Culturally, they are 500 years behind us. They have neither endurance nor our determination, but they are just as good psychologists as we are, and their minds have been sharpened, like ours, by centuries of fine spine-spun logomachy. I don't even know what that term means. We may tell them whatever we like about the, the innocence of our aims, watering them down and sweetening them with honeyed words to make them palatable. But they know what we want, as well as we know what they do not want, right? Let me repeat that. They know what we want, the Zionists, as well as we know what they, the Palestinians, do not want. They feel at least the same instinctive jealous love of Palestine as the old Aztecs felt for ancient Mexico and their Sioux for their rolling hills, i.e. the Lakota, my people. So here, as we can see, Jabotinsky is, is positioning himself as the colonizer. He's positioning himself as the United States positioned itself against us, Lakota people here. And I bring this up because it's it's directly justifying, on one hand, the United States' colonization and taking of native lands, but it's also situating uh, Zionist as a European kind of formation into the role of colonizer and understanding that the you know the the, Arab, the what they call the Arab Palestinians are not going to be easily fooled by this sort of idea of treaty making like they did with us that they know that we are coming to take their land that they know that we are coming to remove them and to replace them so this is an important sort of you know uh letter just to kind of lay it out there they're identifying explicitly a settler colonial project that it's going to require not only the subjugation of palestinians but their removal and their concession to um you know by force hence the name iron wall that's the name of the essay uh by force to the will of european colonizers right so that's that's settler colonialism in a nutshell. That is a far different project than what we we typically uh, understand and know as something called franchise colonialism, or perhaps you know there's another version of colonialism called internal colonialism, and, and it's important to to distinguish them from this version of colonialism, which is settler colonialism, because on one hand, internal colonialism, if we look at um, you know, um, uh, like in in the Americas or in the Western Hemisphere, it's typically indigenous groups uh, uh, are, or nations are within um, those nation states. They're dominated, but they're not necessarily eliminated or removed. They, there are removal processes, right? There's racialization processes that take place, but it's not a kind of settler uh, you know, colonial kind of project, the way that we're seeing with the United States uh, and and Israel. Um, and that's, you know, there's a lot of debate about that term, uh, internal colonialism, but we can bracket that off to like a Q&A. And then the, the, the second uh, version is uh, franchise colonialism, which is like the traditional colonialism, right? It's the colonialism of of the British and, and places like India, for example, where yes, the the British ruled India and did awful things to, you know, the subcontinent. There are many different, you know, it's not just Indians. There are thousands of different ethnic groups, indigenous groups within what is now the kind of state of, of India or the nation state of India. But this project that the uh, British uh, implemented within uh, India was a 
an extractive project, right? About extracting materials, extracting, you know, the the labor of, of the people, but it was never intended on replacing the indigenous population with Br British colonial uh, and settler subjects. But it's not to say that like, you know, settler colonialism and franchise colonialism are different in violence. They're both incredibly violent, right? We can think about the mass starvation of people in India, you know, at the turn of the 19th century, like tens of millions of people were starved to death, right? Um, as a result of this kind of of this kind of colonialism. Or we can look at, you know, the Cote d'Ivoire or the Congo and think about the kind of franchise colonialism that was about extracting, literally extracting human bodies from Africa uh, in the immense amount of, uh, you know, of, of violence, death and destruction, but it never, it, it never created a sort of settler population to replace, uh, you know, the indigenous African people. So those are important things to distinguish, not to say, you know, like one is more inherently more violent than the other, or like one is, you know, has some sort of unique uh, pro you know, there is a unique process, internal process, but it's part of the same sort of overarching structure of, you know, a spe specifically European imperialism. Um, and I'll talk about that, you know, in, in, a, in a little bit, but just to kind of, just to kind of uh, go over some more examples, you know, tip, you know, there's a post-colonial India, right? There, there are very few instances in which there's a post-colonial or post-settler colonialism. I think uh, probably the the one example that comes to mind, and I disagree with some of, um, and my mind has been changed on on a lot of these things over time. Um, there's really great uh, theorists and thinkers and historians such as Joseph Joseph Massad, um, who've who've really challenged my conception of uh, of what settler colonialism is and how it occurs. Uh, but there's also you know Robin D G Kelly has a response to uh, the the. Australian uh, scholar Patrick Wolf, when he talks about just like kind of like the Anglo settler colonies of New Zealand, Australia, um, United States, Canada, etc., as being the only settler colonies. Um, but we now know, I think, with a more a robust analysis of history, that South Africa was a settler colony, that Algeria was a settler colony of, of France. And we saw in the Algerian situation, the process of decolonization, right? It was an attempt to subjugate and eliminate the native population, if not uh, through outright annihilation, but through political and, you know, uh, state sanctioned violence to subjugate them, you know, that decolonization process was incredibly violent. It was, you know, millions, if not 10 million people um, died as a result of that very violent kind of struggle. And we see the same, a similar kind of process unfolding in, uh, you know, in, a, in South Africa, where we, 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 where the term, uh, apartheid was invented, right? And it's important to talk about what apartheid is because there's a UN uh, definition of the crime of apartheid um, that was developed uh, in, in the 1960s, I believe, um, by the anti-apartheid struggle. It's been applied not only to the South African situation, but it's also been applied to the Palestinian situation. But it's not entirely an accurate framing because it's a technology of settler colonialism. It's a technology of rule. It's a way of carving up a territory to concentrate people on land or Bantu stands in the, in the case of South Africa um, through a racial segregation process. Um, we call that in the United States reservations or in Canada, the reserve system, right? And these British, you know, there, there was both kind of influenced by British colonial rule, they were talking to each other. They were saying, you know, Bantu stands are like the, the native reservations of the South, right? But while, you know, the, the apartheid system was, you know, in place, there was a distinct knowledge that the people were placed in within these Bantu stands were actually indigenous people, speaking indigenous language, speaking uh, Swahili, speaking, uh, you know, Zulu, speaking all kinds of different indigenous languages. And some, you know, some people, you know, in very rare instances got so comfortable as, you know, we see oftentimes in reservation systems with the kind of the the territorial sort of rule of a, you know, of a, 
of a government, um, some sort of self-autonomy, um, that they kind of naturalized those conditions, right? And the anti-apartheid movement was about denaturalizing that condition and saying that the white minority controls 70% of the land, 70%, therefore 70% of the resources, while the black majority sits in destitute and is dispossessed from the land, right? And that's the other facet of settler colonialism is that settler colonialism is fundamentally about land and territory. And while, you know, this is kind of a signposting um, something I want to talk about at the end of this conversation, we talk about decolonization and what justice looks like in the context of settler colonialism. We often think, you know, there's a very nice framing that, you know, we have the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, um, you know, applying pressure on apartheid South Africa to, you know, end its apartheid colonial structure. Um, but there was also an active armed resistance movement opposed to the, you know, the apartheid, and it, you know, spilled into Rhodesia. It was, it wasn't just something that was confined to South Africa, but it was a regional war. It was about decolonization and entailed more than just one country. You know, Cuba sent, um, you know, they sent uh, soldiers there. And, and in fact, if Cuba at the, you know, at the request of the anti-apartheid struggle and the liberation movement, if they hadn't been there, they probably, you know, they probably wouldn't have been as victorious uh, in that in that particular struggle. Uh, there's a great, you know, if you ever want to hear, it's it's something that hasn't been written about a lot. Uh, Cuba's sort of solidarity, like military solidarity, it's acknowledged. But there's a book, um, uh, it's called, I think it's called Fidel Castro Speaks. And Fidel, you know, talks a lot about that sort of, you know, that history. And, uh, you know, there were, you know, the Cubans were actively engaged in, engaged in an armed struggle against, you know, Rhodesian soldiers. Um, but Israel was also a kind of a party to this, this uh, struggle and keeping apartheid in place. Israel gave uh, South Africa the, you know, the nuclear, the nuclear bomb. Right. It made it a nuclear power and this idea that once we install a nuclear arsenal into South Africa, it will make the racial white supremacist apartheid regime permanent. It will make settler colonialism permanent. Right. Um, and if we think about even uh, somebody like Nelson Mandela, a lot of people don't know why Nelson Mandela was in prison for such a long time. It was because he refused to renounce armed resistance as a legitimate form of struggle and self-defense period that's why he was in prison and a lot of people kind of you know whitewash you know <laughs> that's not a metaphor whitewash that history um and that he was also a steadfast supporter of palestinian resistance uh, and that's important to remember it was because of the so-called civil society pressures the nonviolent boycotts and protests union organization and mobilization combined with a popular struggle against the apartheid regime. That's what brought it down, right? It wasn't just hugging the murder out of colonizers, um, as often we are implored to do while they shoot us dead, right? In our, in our homes, uh, in our streets and in our own homelands, right? So I think that's an important aspect uh, to remember. Um, Bell, I just want to uh, do a time check. How much time do I have left? Twenty-one minutes. How many minutes? Twenty-one. Okay. So the next section of the next section I want to move into is talking about imperialism um, and uh, and Zionism and manifest destiny. Right. The United States was literally a a small when it when it declared its so-called independence from Britain, it was a small it was small thirteen colonies hugging right the eastern seaboard, which over the course of a century rapidly expanded to uh, an annex billions of acres of land and territory. Right, that oftentimes that violence of expansion was tied into the expansion of chattel slavery, the, the, the enslavement of African peoples, as well as the genocide of indigenous peoples, right? Um, and this is an important turning point in, in not just, uh, you know, the history of North America, but global capitalism as we know it. We have an army of, you know, free laborers who are laboring for free on the land, 
uh, and we're and we have quote quote unquote free land taken from uh, people who are being eliminated and destroyed, right? But typically, when we talk about settler colonialism, we don't think of that as imperialism. But the annexation of territory and land is a form of imperialism. If you look at a map of the United States, you will see every single state was carved out of indigenous territory in a negotiated settlement about whether or not it was going to be a so-called free state or a slave state, right? So westward expansion, even in the political context of formations of states, was fundamentally about expanding on one hand uh, the institution of chattel slavery as well as the in the genocide of indigenous, the genocide and removal of indigenous peoples. Uh, and this happened, happened through treaties. These treaties weren't just like you know, it wasn't this like a mutual coming together of people. There was one side that had a clear intent to take the land, right? Um, and it was, it happened basically through trick or treaty in the sense that if you do not sign this treaty, we will wage endless war upon you, right? And this was guaranteed in the very founding document of the United States, which is the Declaration of Independence. Read it, please. Because the third, the 23rd, um, the 23rd complaint that the the American colonists uh, filed against the King of England said that, you know, the merciless Indian savages who inhabit our frontier, you know, whose only known rule of warfare is the destruction of any age of person, any sex, man, woman, or child, right? In other words, they're, they're waging a savage war on us. That was pure projection. Um, it was a way to dehumanize native people in the first instance to make their resistance appear as something that that goes beyond what we understand the normal rules of warfare. Therefore, subjecting not just uh, native soldiers, uh, native warriors um, for elimination and target, but also subjugating women, children, people who are considered "quote unquote" non-combatants or civilians. Right? That the the entire destruction of indigenous peoples was guaranteed as a form of self-defense. The first rule of settler colonialism is to make invasion look like self-defense. Watch any Western movie, watch any US military movie that came out during the war on terror or before, and they make the cowboy, the American soldier, an invader to a land who is surrounded by native people, and he has to kill all these native people in order to defend his territory, right? Which he invaded and stole. That's the... The, you know, that is the, you know, the United States is just one bad Western movie, right? When you really think about it. And, 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 and in that, you know, in that case, I guess, like the state of Israel is just an even worse Western movie, <laughs> like um, when you think about it. But I think that's an important sort of cultural phenomenon to point out and how manifest destiny sort of, you know, ingrains itself within the everyday culture of, of settlers themselves, because it's not just a political ideology. It's, some, it's a cultural ideology. It is the status quo of a society, right? So when we say things like land back, when we advocate for, you know, the, the return of land that was rightly rightfully taken from us, and you hear, you know, African revolutionaries say this all the time, we will pay you for the land what your ancestors paid us for the land, because that is justice. And then you hear, you know, all these, you know, white people freaking out in Africa being like, white genocide, right? Because they know that they took the land. They didn't pay anything for the land, right? Um, and they had to, in fact, they had to enslave and genocide people, just as they did uh, to people here uh, in the United States. So when they think of justice, when we advocate uh, for our fundamental right to exist and to have access to our territory, uh, which is actually upheld by the laws of the colonizer to begin with, that it becomes, oh, they're going to do to us what we did to them because the settler colonial mentality is a zero-sum game. There can be no alternative other than the settler state, period. That's, that's the reality. So whenever Native people in the United States advocate for land back, we don't constitute a majority of the demo, you know the the population of the United States you know we don't pres uh, present a military threat to the United States but nonetheless when we engage in nonviolent resistance even to that extent to protect our water 
from the expansion of oil pipelines across our lands, we are criminalized. We are called terrorists. Much in the same vein and spirit of the founding fathers who, who you know, called us merciless Indian savages, right? Um, and that's an important fact to remember, right? It's an important fact to also understand that with the the kind of uh, barbarity and the brutality in which the United States destroys or attempts to destroy indigenous nations and sub subjugate us to take our land, to criminalize us. This isn't something that happened in the 19th century. It happened during the 1970s, the formation of the American Indian movement and the Red Power movement. The FBI deployed you know, its goons to essentially destroy that movement, to destroy it from the inside to the point that we, you know, we have in in southern Southern Florida, not in Southern Florida, but in Florida, the known political prisoner of Leonard Peltier. He's the longest serving indigenous political prisoner in the United States. Why? Because his co-defendants in a case um, were let off, declared not guilty by reason of self-defense for for shooting two shooting and killing two FBI agents who came onto land, opened fire, gunfight ensued, uh, and these his co-defendants were acting in self-defense, but Leonard Peltier was tried separately um, and found guilty for a crime he claims he never committed, right? But it wasn't just about adjudicating that sort of criminal act. It was about punishing the Red Power movement, the indigenous movement for liberation and to to capture it, right? To, to uh, basically subjugate it and to destroy it, right? So when we think about imperialism, it's not just the expansion of, you know, this kind of economic system to take resources. It's also about destroying any alternative that arises to challenge its, its hegemony. Why, why invade Vietnam, you know, uh, which was largely a peasant country at that particular in time because of the spread of communism, right? Because of the spread of an alternative to capitalism. That's why, that's what we're also seeing in the context of Palestine, when, you know, when after the, the Nakba in 1948, um, you know, the, United, the, the state of Israel wasn't really, it was on the radar of the United States, but it wasn't really on the radar of the United States. It was, you know, the United States was kind of lukewarm when it came to Israel. Sure, it supported the project, you know, this and that, but it wasn't until 1967 that when the when the when Israel you know the 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 war in 1967 that Israel proved itself in the eyes of the United States as a legitimate military presence uh, in the Middle East to destroy to break apart and to finish um, you know finish dividing up and and subjugating these you know newly kind of arising Arab uh, Muslim nations within uh, the Middle East. Uh, to bend towards the will of the United States. You know, Joe Biden has has said, you know, before he became president that if Israel didn't exist, we would invent it. He didn't mean it in the terms of like an apology for a European apology for what Europeans did to uh, to uh, Jewish people and their their long, violent, genocidal history against Jewish people in Europe. No, he meant it as a military base that you, uh, that Israel would be the projection of power of the United States within the region. It would destabilize. It would it would it would break the sort of solidarity between uh, these these Arab nations who had resources um, that the United States you know wanted to maintain access to. Right. So it had to destroy political alternatives that were arising within it, the, the non-aligned movement, the decolonization movement, the Arab national movements, right, that were coming through. So this is uh, this is a, the reason why when we talk about settler colonialism, it's not just, you know, it's not just a kind of land-based, you know, uh, project within a, a territory of Palestine, which is not very much larger than the state of New Jersey, right? This is a small territory, but yet it has captured the imagination of both the imperialist and those struggling to get free. Such a tiny, tiny place has such a major you know, impact on world politics and geopolitics and the shifts that are happening and the struggles to get free. Such a tiny nation has such a big heart for the rest of the world, right? That we as indigenous people here, you know, it's bleeding. We can see it. 
but it's beating strong and it's it's beating strong not just because of our solidarity and our good wishes and us taking to the streets but because there's active resistance right it's the only way that they're going to survive this genocidal onslaught and they don't want us to think of them if they do think of the want us to think of them they don't want us to think of them but anything beyond just being a victim right? But they are agents, just like we were agents in our time period. We were agents and makers of our own history. And that's what they're trying to, they're, they're trying to recapture. They're trying to put them back into bondage and say, no, you will not be your agent of own history. You can only be a terrorist or you can only be dead, right? Those are the only two options that they provide, uh, not only for people who decide that they don't, you know, they don't want to buy what the, the United States is selling, um, but they also say that to the people who whose very existence is dependent on them, you know, standing up to the colonizer. And so um, this I'm out, I'm out of time, but I think this is the kind of crux of the issue in this particular uh, moment. And the reason, you know, when we think about settler colonialism, there's often this other kind of framing to think about, well, it's the breakaway from a mother country. But I would say, that Israel, like the United States, has never fully broken away from its European parents. It is both are fundamentally European projects. And we can't look, you know, we can't look to the imperialist kind of alternatives that have been provided to us, which are destroying the planet. They're holding the world hostage. We can't have any other economic social alternative. Um, so they that cannot be the path that we take. Europe must pay for Europe's, Europe's crimes, but it is not incumbent on, upon us to adopt those as our, our sort of principles and our understanding of what it means to not only be human, but what it means to be free and to advocate for freedom. And so when we think about this in this context, the, the Israel could, can only exist through its primary benefactor, its mother country, the United States and Europe. Right, much as when the United States declared its so-called independence and led its counter-revolutionary war against us uh, and our black relatives, it benefited Europe. It raised the standing, the standard of living in Europe. Those trade goods went there, much in the same way that the continued projection of U.S. power in that region benefits the ruling class here in in the United States uh, and in Europe. So. I'll just end it there. And thanks so much for listening.